you know, I can recognize when I'm acting freely and when I'm not. And I'm not taking in, in recognizing that and saying that's that's what I call a free action. This raising my hand, that's a, that was a free action. I did it because I wanted to make a philosophical point. There's no assumption built into that that it wasn't the product of, of causal processes that were ultimately outside my control. I mean, I don't have to control everything to control something. I mean, it's really just taking seriously the idea that we are part of the world, that that some causal processes are constitute us. <laughs> and if the ones that are occurring in me, and uh, uh, if, if, if the relevant causal processes are happening within me, then that makes them my causal processes. Hello, my geeselings. It is Robinson Earhart, Mother Goose. And this is the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 61. And this episode is with Keith Frankish, who's an honorary professor in the philosophy department at the University of Sheffield. And currently, because he now resides in Crete, he is adjunct professor with the Brain and Mind program at the University of Crete. Now, Keith is best known for two things, his two-level view of the human mind, which he covers in his book, uh, Mind and Supermind, but also, and more recently and much more publicly, his defense of the philosophical thesis known as illusionism, which holds that phenomenal consciousness. So all of our experiences, uh, qualia, our seeing of color, it's all an illusion. And this is, as I'm sure you are thinking as you listen to this, quite perplexing and counterintuitive. So that's what Keith and I discuss in this episode. Uh, we discuss a variety of aspects of illusionism. We discuss its relationship to free will, its relationship to other theories in the philosophy of mind, uh, particularly Pat Churchland's and Daniel Dennett's. We discuss its relationship to cognitive science and other areas of psychology or neuroscience and how the thesis sort of interacts or drives with the other adjacent literature. And we also, and this is one of my uh, favorite parts of the episode, uh, get a reading from Keith on one of, well, it's a reading of one of Shakespeare's sonnets. So one, you should check out uh, Kevin O'Regan's demonstrations of change blindness, because that's something we discuss at length in the episode. And there's, there's a link in the description. And you can keep up with Keith and his work on his website, which is keithfrankish.com, or through his Twitter, which is at Keith Frankish. And he's also, along with Philip Goth, a, another philosopher in the UK, the host of the podcast Mind Chat, which, as you might imagine, centers around philosophy and the mind. Uh, the last thing I'll note, just because I think it's kind of funny, I'm going to tell a story. So I, when I was in undergrad, I had an astronomy professor who I really liked a lot, and he was an old guy. This is kind of funny. This actually isn't part of the story that I was going for. But one day he showed up to class and was really thrilled, and he asked like this 300-lecture room, have any of you guys heard of the Google because he had just discovered it, and it was really exciting for him. But anyway, uh, one day my cousin was visiting. He was, uh, I guess, shadowing or something like that. And that happened to be the day where my 80-year-old professor forgot one of his buttons to button one of his buttons on his shirt. And his belly button was just sticking out the whole time as he was like walking around lecturing, and it was very funny. But anyway, I had that problem in this episode. Not that I forgot to button a button but my shirt i guess was just too tight and i probably shouldn't be pointing this out but like my belly button was constantly trying to break free from my shirt and i was using the cat as a prop uh, or my hands to protect myself and my belly button the entire time but maybe if you're watching the video uh, you can keep keep an eye out for the belly button dynamics and then Lastly, you will see that I'm wearing this fancy schmancy new shirt. I purchased the domain robinsonsfashionempire.com uh, because the Robinsons podcast 
universe is branching into multiple different directions. And I mean, you can buy the shirt. That's what it's for, but you don't have to. And then I also have the second show, Robinson Eats, in which I eat some ice cream and talk with whoever's there every morning, Palo Alto time, uh, indeterminate time, uh, but on Twitch and it's also on YouTube. And then leaving reviews, comments, these things always help. Without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Keith. been working on the last many years is illusionism and Mm -hmm. as far as i can tell your discussion of illusionism or the discussion more broadly speaking begins with the hard problem of consciousness and maybe we could start off by saying a bit about what the hard problem is and how it differs from what we might call the easy problem Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well, the distinction, the, the, the terms were introduced by David Chalmers in the mid 1990s, first in the paper in 1995, I think, and then in his book, The Conscious Mind, 1996. And I, I guess this, the distinction uh, had um, people had been aware of the distinction, but it, it hadn't been, uh, it didn't have this, um, these names and, um, and this, this clarity of. Uh, presentation that uh, David gave it. So the idea is that the the easy problems are ex- explaining the sort of things that cognitive scientists focus on explaining, explaining functions, explaining things the brain does. Um, if you ask a cognitive scientist to, ex- to talk about perception, they will talk about uh, processing of, of visual information. Um, about how um, the sensory cortex processes signals, mm-hmm. um, processes visual signals, and extracts, and recognizes certain, looks for certain patterns in them uh, that are characteristic of certain features in the world, and then it um, edges, colors, shapes, and so on, and then integrates this information. And then uses, and then how further systems then use this information to uh, detect, to recognize objects, to classify th- uh, um, what's being um, observed as an object of a certain kind, and then how this information is then used by other brain systems. Uh, uh, how it's used in reasoning, in the control of behavior. It's all about. The brain doing things in very much the way that other bodily organs do things. The mm-hmm. digestive system processes food and extracts nutrients. Uh, the liver performs all sorts of clever chemical uh, um, uh, operations on the blood. And so on. The organs do things, and the idea is that the, the, the brain is a very, very complex. Um, organ that, that performs lots and lots of functions. So in Often a way the easy in informational terms. Sorry? So in a way the easy problem kind of boils down to the aspects of the brain that we all agree can be viewed or measured from the outside. And there's there's not much of a dispute there. Uh, yes, not not so easily observed from the outside, but yes, but yeah. they can all be characterized in terms of functions of thing of operations that are being carried out mm-hmm. of, of, of th- certain things being done <laughs> mm-hmm. and then in principle there's no there's no difficulty in principle of seeing how these things how how these things uh, can be explained because you just need to suppose that there's some mechanism some some some, some biological mechanism in the brain that does those things that implements those functions uh, so as soon as you, if, if you think of mental processes in these terms, in, t- in functional terms, then they don't seem deeply mysterious. They seem quite, 
variables and very complex and uh, um, it would be quite a challenge to explain them, but there doesn't seem to be any difficulty in principle in seeing how it could be done. We just need to, to say, how is the brain doing this? What sort of structures mm -hmm. have evolved to do that? Um, and can we find those structures and see how they work? So when you think about, that, about the mind in that way, uh, it doesn't seem deeply mysterious. And there doesn't sure. seem any reason to deny that it's uh, that it's physical in the sense that it's uh, constituted, completely constituted by um, um, uh, the, the same sort of processes that constitute the rest of the world. Um, right. In this way, it's not different from the liver or the heart, as you mentioned. Exactly. exactly. It's yeah. just a complex biological organism that does some very fancy things, things that we tend to characterize in terms of information processing. Maybe that, that there are alternative ways of characterizing, but that's a, that's a convenient way of doing it. Getting information about the world, using that information to regulate the body and to control behavior. So it's thinking of the, 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 the mind essentially as a control system. Okay, so there, uh, and so there are many, many different as aspects to this, different functions you can look at. But they, the, the, the None of them seem deeply mysterious. They're all easy in that sense, in that we can see how we can explain these things. Now, the hard problem is supposed to be uh, is, is, is focuses on another aspect of the mind, because it, it seems that when we think about our minds <laughs> from the inside, as it were, uh, they're doing something more than just carrying out all these wonderful. Um, information processing operations, they're creating this inner world which seems to have a character that can't be described in those third personal informational functional terms. It's, well, as Thomas Nagel put it, it's like something to be me and to be you. There's this world of, <laughs> now we start to, we start to struggle for, for, for terms. Um, mm -hmm. When I when I when I perceive the world around me, I don't just get it seems I don't just get information about it about what's uh, about the, the the kinds of uh, things that are around me uh, information that there are certain I'm looking at a row of books that have different colours I don't just get I don't just my senses don't just tell me that there are uh, there are books there that are green and yellow and, and black and red and so on. They also create a, a sensation in me of uh, greenness and yellowness and blackness and redness and so on. There's this, it's like something for me to see those the colored spines of those books. Mm -hmm. And that seems much harder to explain. It seems that I could, in principle, get all that information. My brain could extract all that information about what's out there and about the kind of light that the different objects are reflecting and, it's, uh, and use that information to regulate my behavior and perhaps for me to say oh well that's yellow and that's red and that's blue so, without it actually being like anything for me to see them uh, we could imagine uh, uh, maybe a robot or an a, another version of me, a zombie version of me, that doesn't have this inner world, but still gets all the same information, still uses it in the same way, still responds in the same way to the will, still says, well, there's a yellow book there and a red book there and a blue book there and so on, but isn't actually feeling that the quality of the blueness and the redness and, and so on, which I keep using different colors. Um, and similarly, like, well, let's take, take something like pain. Again, you can think of pain as, in informational terms, it's it's detecting uh, certain kinds of disturbance or damage to one's body. The signals from the um, pain receptors, nociceptors, and then you know, these signals are being uh, processed by pain centers in the brain, and they're producing all kinds of of uh, reactions, and you know, causing me to display all the signs of being in pain which is presumably what's important from an evolutionary point of view, that I react appropriately to the pain. That's the whole point of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
without it actually, but then what about the actual feeling of the pain itself? The actual awfulness, pure awfulness of the pain, that seems to be something extra over and above all the performance of all the functions. How do we explain that? And that's a hard problem because it's hard because we don't seem to have any idea of how we could even set about explaining it. It seems that all these complex processes occurring in my brain that we can characterize in, 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 um, uh, in third personal terms in terms of the, informa the information processing or whatever, all that happens. And then something extra happens as well. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> And it's sometimes this this, this extra thing is is, is um, characterized as a, a an extra property that my brain seems to acquire. My brain, like um, the brain, uh, the brain states involved in perception or feeling pain seem to acquire an extra property, mm -hmm. phenomenal property, quale or what it's likeness, um, which somehow just seems to pop into existence almost gratuitously. Mm -hmm. um, and so some people think, well, that's, that's how it is. We've just got to accept that these properties just do come along <laughs> with all those complex uh, uh, functional properties. These, these extra intrinsic fields just pop into existence alongside them, and that's just how the world is. And all we can do really is um, describe the conditions under which they come into existence mm -hmm. and leave it at that. And... You open up one of your papers on illusionism with a really nice example that I think explains, or maybe not explains, but points out our options for responding to a nominalist phenomenon, like consciousness, where it's there, but it doesn't sort of fit with any of the other, well... We don't have an answer. Science doesn't give us an answer, at least at this point, at least that's not generally accepted about or to the hard problem. So the anomalous phenomenon I have in mind now is psychokinesis. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could if you could run very briefly through the psychokinesis example mm -hmm. and what our responses are, what our potential options are for dealing with it. Yes, yes. So psychokinesis, that's um, the... Uh, ability to move things by the power of your mind alone. Mm -hmm. Of course, in a sense, we can do that. I can move my hand by the power of my mind alone. <laughs> that's, that's very that's, true. That, that's not the... Um, that's, the idea is that you, I can move something completely independent of me just by, the, just by concentrating on it. I can make one of the books over there move, say. Uh, so say you see, some, you see someone demonstrating this, this power. Um... Uh, or apparently demonstrating this power. So they, 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 they sit down and um, there was a couple of, there was someone who, who was famous for doing this. They could appear to move the pages of a book. They would just stare at the book and the pages would flip like this. Just, oh, really? They just focus like this. Uh, quite famous. I can't remember their name now, but if you Google uh, psychic page turning, <laughs> they would stare at the book and the page would flip. Stare again hard. Um, so you've got three options, really. You can say, "Why right, this is something? This is they're genuinely doing this. They're genuinely making the the page move there by the power of their mind alone, not by any other, not by any trick." Actually, what the person was doing in this case was they 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 they, they, were, they could blow a very <laughs> fine focus jet of air from the corner of their mouth. They were very, very skilled at this. It was very focused jet of air. And they could, you know, the first option is nothing like that was happening. Nothing trick, no, no trickery like that. They really were moving this, uh, uh, these, this, the, these objects simply by the power of their minds, just by concentrating on them. No physical means involved at all. No secretly blowing. Or kind of thing. And that just cannot be explained in terms of current science. We're going to need a, com a kind of a scientific revolution to explain that. Okay, so it's real, it's anomalous, it's real, and it's not explicable at all within current science. Um, so that's the first option, and I call that realism because it's, it's, it's 
phenomenon is real. And it's radical because it means that this is something really new, really novel, inexplicable within current scientific frameworks. And the second option is to say, yes, it's real. They really were moving it by, by the power of the mind. But we can actually explain it in terms of known uh, science. So uh, actually, in terms of psychokinesis, it's quite hard to think how you might do that. But maybe there's some sort of magnetic resonance yeah, yeah, or something yeah. they can create inside their... Maybe this works. <clears throat> maybe they could do it with metallic objects or something. Maybe they can create some sort of magnetic, strong magnetic field or something that could influence these things. But the, the idea is that it's real, but we can explain it within current science. So that's what I call conservative realism. It's realism because the thing actually happens, and it's conservative because you don't need to have radically new theories to explain it. And then the third option is to say it's, it's not really happening at all. It's, or, I mean, something's happening. Certainly something's wow. happening. The pages are turning. But then <clears throat> in that's not what you think it is. It's not what they're presenting it as, not what it seems to be. They're not really doing it by the power of their minds. They're doing it by blowing on the pages or something like that. And that is, that's a conservative position. So it certainly doesn't require any, any, any um, uh, scientific revolutions. And, uh, uh, but it's not realism. It's, it's irrealism. It's a conservative, irrealist position. And I call it illusionism because it seems to be happening, but isn't really. And is this where you would try to point to oh they're blowing on the paper or something to that effect yeah yeah that that's that would be a good example of it. yes they're creating the effect you see uh, this is what magic is all about that's stage magic it's about creating effects on the audience it's making it the audience react as if they're seeing something they're not seeing mm -hmm. it's making them it's producing the effect of seeing something without you actually seeing it what you're seeing is something very something different from what you think you see mm -hmm. and that's the analogy that i use mm -hmm. and consciousness. yeah right and then the relationship to consciousness as i understand it is that following the the line of the hard problem again the experiences that we're having that appear to have this phenomenal quality are just an illusion that we're, we're they don't have this phenomenal quality we're just made to feel somehow that we do is that the right gloss to put on it or would you yeah, put it differently ne nearly um yeah look this when you when i when you when i'm in when you're in pain when you when i have a visual experience let's see the colors over there smell something taste them something's happening all right there's definitely something happening, and it's happening in, in me and you. Also. And we can recognize when it's happening. Uh, when I, um, if I uh, stub my toe, then I instantly enter a certain state that I recognize. I don't like being in a state that I call pain. And I uh, protest about it, and I, it, it, it breaks all sorts of reactions in me. Uh, yeah, that state is real. There's no doubt about that. And it's a, not a nice state to be in. Uh, and some of all other experiences, we can recognize them when we, when we have them. Um, and they are whatever they are. <laughs> okay. Um, and also, interestingly, we can recognize them in other people. I think I can recognize, uh, I can recognize when my dog is in pain pretty much as easily as I can recognize when I'm in pain. It, doesn't I can almost see that it's in pain. I don't really need <laughs> it doesn't require a lot of influence. It's obviously in pain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um now so okay, so there's something now the, the analogy there is with um again with the the psychokinesis. There's something certainly happening. There's a person there, there's a book they're saying the pages are flipping over. That's happening, that's real. The question is are we interpreting it in the right way? Okay, so I'm certainly not saying that experiences are not real. Uh, the experiences themselves are not real, that there's nothing happening when you're in pain, or there's nothing happening when you're seeing things. There's certainly something happening. There's a huge... Uh, the, the, uh, there's the uh, uh, comparison with stage magic makes clear. There's a lot happening, and it's often something very, very complex that's happening. In fact, what's happening 
when you see a piece of stage magic, say David Copperfield flying, is actually much more complex than what you think is happening. I mean, <laughs> uh, he seems just to be levitating off the air by some pure uh, I don't, willpower or something. Mm -hmm. Actually, what's happening is a lot more complex. There's a lot of machinery involved in getting him up there. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's taken months, years of careful work to produce that effect. Okay, so there's something real happening, something complex happening. My claim is that we're misconceptualizing it as something over and above all that complex information processing activity. Um, so putting it simply something like this, we, the idea is that we, the, the, there is all that um, neural activity that's involved in perception. And let's suppose there's some sort of mechanisms of self-monitoring within the brain that are monitoring that activity. Well, you can think of lots of reasons why it'd be very useful to be able to monitor your own um, uh, mental states, your own sensory states, so that you could tell people about them, for example. So that when, if, if you um, monitor your own uh, experiences, you can tell other people which, what you're having rather than just displaying the reactions. So I don't, you know, if you can, if you can tell internally that you're in pain, then you can talk about it and remember it and think about it in a way that uh, I, I think probably animals can't. They just are in pain and just manifest the immediate reactions. So let's suppose there's some sort of monitoring mechanism that monitors these processes, the pain process. Uh, and let's suppose that that monitoring process misrepresents them in some way. Represents them, let's say, in a very simplified way. I mean, we're talking about vastly complex processes in the visual cortex. It represents them to the rest of the brain, to other brain systems, in a very simplified, schematic, caricatured way. And the upshot of that is that when we try to describe what our experiences are like, we find we can't really say much about them, except, well, it has a sort of quality to it. I'm in mm -hmm. one of those states again. And what's it like? Um, well, it's, it's like pain is. And what we're actually reporting there, what we're actually tracking, is a hugely complex set of functional processes in the brain, both the informational processes and then the reactions, internal reactions to those processes. <clears throat> a whole lot of stuff's going on. And thanks to mechanisms of self-monitoring, we have some, some limited access to it and we can recognize it and we can say that it's that state again, but we can't give any of the detail of it. We can't tell you exactly what kind of functions are, occur are being performed, what sort of information processing is going, what, what kind of reactions I'm having. Uh, reactions, uh, experience primes all kinds of reactions. Uh, it's not just, I don't mean just reactions that um, avert reactions, like uh, um, moving and talking and um, so on. I mean all kinds of small adjustments um, to the rest of our, of our neural configuration to, adjustments to memory, priming effects on behavior, expectation effects. Every experience primes us to, ex to expect something a little bit different the next, next moment. So there's a huge wave of, re of stuff happening in us. And we're monitoring that in some uh, uh, sketchy way that in, is just enough detail to enable us to recognize the state and, remember it and tell, talk about it, but not it for us to have any insight into its nature. And so when we're asked what it's like, we say, well, it, it's just got a feel to it. And that feel seems mysterious, but it's a, it's a, a hugely compressed representation of a lot of complexity. So the apparently mysterious, simple feel is actually the result of a very um, uh, compressed representation of a lot of unmysterious complexity. So we're mistaking unmysterious, un masses and masses of easy problems for one compound hard problem. Right. Um, and in the same way that when you see uh, a, a magic trick being performed, you're mistaking a lot of very, very complex, often stage machinery for a simple uh, magical effect. And it's been designed that way. And I think probably the processes of introspection of self-monitoring have been 
designed similarly. Um, we don't need all the details. We just need a quick update on how things are going inside us. <laughs> okay, what's, it, what, what's my status right now? Are things going well? Are they going badly? What effect is that thing having on me that I, that's over there? And I can detect the thing and I detect how it's affecting me. And that's what mm -hmm. I call the feel of the thing. Um, Just a quick yeah. taxonomical question. So mm -hmm. I'm guessing that the radical realist uh, mm -hmm. to put a name to mm -hmm. this camp it might be somebody like Penrose who <laughs> thinks we have to radically revise physics, I think, to account for mm -hmm. consciousness. Th then maybe a conservative... Yeah, I, I, I suppose sorry. he might be... Um, I, 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 certainly there'd be a candidate for putting that camp. They might be on the border, though, with the with the conservative, he certainly thinks he's certainly a realist. He might be on the border and thinking that current science in uh, the, some regions of current science, quantum uh, physics, for example, maybe are already providing us with the sort of theory we need. But it's um, it, uh, he, um, so. I guess the um, the approach that he favours is drawing a lot on. On, on existing science, but trying to take it a bit further. So it's sort of on the border between saying we can explain it within current frameworks and, um, and we need radically new ones. Um, the, the more radical ones I'm thinking of are things like panpsychism, for example, um, which um, takes through that all of matter has this fundamental qualitative aspect um, okay. uh, and forms of, of uh, various forms of dualism. But yeah, yes, actually, I mean, maybe Penrose would, would come down more on the more on the on the radical side, I think, perhaps than the conservative side. And then the distinction between the conservative side and mm. your view is at this point still just slightly murky to me because you don't want to deny that we're having these phenomenal yeah. experiences. Mm. And if you could just again very quickly explain where the crucial difference yeah. is if yeah. if both seems to because both views seem to ex, both both categories seem to want to explain the phenomenal experience with with science that we already really have more or less yeah it's it's, it's a good point and it's the thing that i'm often pressed on what exactly is it that i'm denying and if um if i give some rather heavily theoretical account of what uh is phenomenal properties, qualia, these mis this, this feel what it's supposed to be, then you'll find that realists, some realists will say, well, we, we, we're never all that invested, heavily invested in that, in that, um, uh, in that theoretical conception of these things, which I'll say, there's this feel there, and it's just real, and it's immediate, and it <laughs> exists. Are you denying that? So if we start with a very watered down conception of what, um, uh, of what this, uh, this qualitative aspect is what it is like aspect is then it seems that, uh, that i'm under pressure to say well you know yeah you can't deny that um i think probably the way i'm uh the one way of putting it is that i deny that there's anything that poses a hard problem anything that can't be explained within current frameworks the sort of frameworks that cognitive science currently has uh, anything that requires us, anything that forces us uh, into radical theorizing. Now, but as you say, there are a lot of people who think that that um, uh, uh, that we can be, we can acknowledge the reality of uh, phenomenal consciousness, phenomenality, um, without being forced into those radical positions. Well, okay, so now we get into. <laughs> I guess now I'm, I'm inclined to ask them what exactly it is they think they're trying to explain. I mean, we can start with a, a neutral ex, explanander, I think. There are these states we enter, and we, um, states we call pain, seeing, tasting, smelling spe spe specific things, seeing yellow, smelling strawberries, whatever. Uh, we enter these states, and we can recognize when we, e we enter them, and uh, we can recognize when other people enter them generally pretty reliably. So there's something happening there, okay? Um, and so that's what we need to explain. Um, 
without any, without imposing any theoretical, any conceptual framework on it. That state, whatever it is, that's what we need, need to explain. And we could go a bit further. We can say we're, we're tempted to describe these states as having some qualitative aspect that seems at least at first sight to present a hard problem, okay? A problem that does require radical thought. Um, so let's, let's try and investigate what's going on. And suppose we come up with a, an account of what is going on um, that, uh, that takes the sort of form that I was sketching there that says, well, there's, there's, uh, all that's going on really are um, complex forms of information processing and self-monitoring, which create in us the sense, the belief, <laughs> that there's something more going off, that there's something extra, something, mis something mysterious going off. Then I'm inclined to say, well, that's it. We stop there. Um, we've explained all there is to explain. We shouldn't say, yes, but that sense that there's something mysterious go uh, occurring, that there's something mysterious occurring, that sense is correct and we must trust it and we must go beyond that account. It's not enough to explain why we have this belief that there's something mysterious occurring. There actually is something mysterious occurring and we must explain it. Um, now, so turning to the conservative people, uh, I'm inclined to say, which way do you go on that? If we had a complete account of what's occurring when we're in experience, an account which, from which it followed that we would be convinced there was something mysterious occurring, something that we'd be inclined to point at and say, the phenomenal feel of experience, this, this, this what it's like, this, this intrinsic... Uh, it would follow from our account that we would have that belief, that conviction, without supposing it to be actually true. Would they be happy with that? Would they... Uh, um, um, accept that as a satisfactory account of consciousness, or would they say, no, no, this, we need to go up another step? And so I kind of put it back to them and ask them and put pressure on them to say, look, really, when it comes down to it, there's only two ways you go here. You either take these intuitions of hardness seriously, or you don't. And if you don't, mm -hmm. then you end up on my side. And if you do, then you end up on the radical side. And so I've been kind of I see. that I don't, I'm not sure there's a coherent middle ground that says, well, yeah, there really is this, this, this stuff that poses a hard problem, but I've got it cracked, I've got it solved <laughs> in virtue of the easing. So in a way, I'm I'm actually endorsing Chalmers' way of framing this right. in terms of there really being a ch hard choice point here. You know, yeah. um, um, do you accept there's a hard problem? Okay, you, you're radical. Do you not? Then you're an illusion. Uh, right. I, I think, think that, the, that's very people helpful. in the middle are trying to. I, I wrote a paper about ten years ago now called <laughs> "Quining Diet Qualia." That's a reference to a famous paper, much more famous than mine, uh, in <laughs> 1998 by um, Daniel Dennett called "Quining Qualia." Qualia are these. You know, what it's like properties that present a hard problem. And uh, Quining uh, is a little philosophical joke referring to Willard Quine, who denied the existence of an analytic synthetic distinction. So he denied the existence of something that everybody else believed in. So Dennett was going to Quine, Qualia, deny the existence of something that everyone else believed in. And he wrote a wonderful paper showing why there are so many uh, deep conceptual problems with the notion of Qualia. Not just that Qualia can't be explained, but that it's really hard um, even to take qualia seriously on their own terms. I we could get into that if you want. Uh, so I wrote, uh, but, but then one response to that paper that, well, that many of the conservative realist type of people um, had was to say, well, okay, yeah, then it's really shown that that theoretically laid and that heavy duty notion of qualia, it's, you know, you can't believe in those. That doesn't work. Um, but still, there's. It's still a what it's likeness. There's still this feel, this phenomenal property. And this, and that's real, and we've got to explain that still. So we carry on um, with uh, uh, trying to address something like the hard problem. Uh, and so in my paper, I, I, I use this soft drink metaphor. I said, what Dennett, let's call the things that Dennett attacked classic qualia. And let's call what these... Um, 
these uh, conservative theorists believe in diet qualia, they're, they're sort of watered down version of qualia. They're still qualia, but they've kind of got a bit of the, uh, I've got all the, I don't know, all the caffeine and the sugar or whatever, just the diet, diet versions. And I wrote a paper called Quining Diet Qualia, arguing that this notion really doesn't hold up either, and that when you put pressure on it, it, it either inflates back into classic qualia, which they, they, people don't want, or deflates into something still weaker, which I called, uh, very cleverly, zero qualia, which I essentially just the illusion of qualia. Um, so that's, that's my kind of strategy, is to put pressure on those people in the middle to say, you can't have your cake and eat it, you've got to go, go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that... I think that's very helpful and it explains why there was it felt like there was a little bit of murkiness between the conservative realist position and your mm -hmm. position because maybe the conservative position is a little bit inconsistent. It seems inconsistent at least. That's the line I push on them anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a lot now, of murkiness in this area because terms are I mean the, the whole thing is um, is uh, grounded in, a, in, 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 in in murkiness, if you like. I mean, the the famous um, quotation that Ned, uh, Ned Block used, I think, from um, I think it's from either Louis Armstrong or Fats One, I'm not sure who, from a jazz musician, anyway, who said of jazz, if you uh, if you if you have to ask what it is, you ain't never going to get to know. <laughs> And the idea is that that's the same for phenomenal consciousness. That don't ask me to, exp to to define what it is that I'm talking about. Don't ask me to describe it. It's just, you know what it is. I know what it is. We all know what it is. Ah, uh, well, let's let's <laughs> start doing serious philosophy on this on this thing. And I, I I think that's I think we do have to ask. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very unwise to try to build philosophical edifices on something so nebulous mm -hmm. so i i talked to pat churchland uh yeah. a few days ago hers was the the mm -hmm. last episode that i released and these these aren't heard words but mm -hmm. i'm going to put this uh attribute this sort of to her or what i inferred it seems like the proponent of the reality of the hard problem their maybe tactic is to show what the science can't explain. Mm. Whereas the tactic of the eliminative materialist or mm -hmm. maybe, well, I'll just stick with the eliminative materialist for now, is to show what the science can explain. And I'm assuming that as an irrealist uh, opposing the uh, radical realist, you will also be relying on a similar tactic of showing, yes, there are all these really complex processes. Let's show what they are, what they're capable of, and then how they boil down to this m very simplified representation in the brain. Uh, is that is that sort of accurate that you'll be following a, a scheme sort of like this to support the illusionist position? Yes, I think um, as I see the, um, I see I see. I see Pat as, 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 an, as an ally. I always have done. I have huge respect for her, though I know she doesn't like the illusionist uh, label, at least. Um, um, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> um, yes, I think I'm, I'm, what you said, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly brought in sympathy with. I, I see the, as far as explaining phenomenal consciousness goes, it seems to me what we need to explain is... Uh, all of the associate, all of the effects characteristic of phenomenal consciousness, um, including centrally uh, our beliefs about it. Why do we think it exists? My, um, my. So the a specifically illusionist problem will be. What is it about the nature of perception itself and introspection and sensory introspection, the nature of sens sensory perception and sensory introspection that leads us to have this conviction that there's something deeply mysterious about our own consciousness? 
and so that's a that's that's a quite a specific question about certain um, certain uh, um, cognitive functions. My thought is that once you've ex- once if we can explain that, then we've ex- then we've explained all that needs to be explained. You you did just me- you just mentioned sensory perception and, and sensory sensory introspection, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering if contra the hard realist or not the hard realist, the mm-hmm. radical realist, mm-hmm. there are, are ways you have in mind in which you can draw on the psychological literature, the cognitive science literature, or the neuroscientific literature in these domains to support the illusionist perspective. Well, the I've, illusionist abs- perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. This is, I, I'd I, love to hear about that. I, I, absolutely. This is, um, this is what I think, <laughs> this is what I think, scientists working on consciousness should be doing or should be doing a lot more of. Um, I mean, one, one project, a large project in consciousness science is to identify um, what are called the neural correlates of consciousness. The idea being that, yes, there is this, uh, there's this phenomenal consciousness, the, the sort of the inner lights really do come on. Um, and that's somehow being produced by the brain. So let's try and find the brain mechanisms that are causing it to happen. Even though we can't explain, even though perhaps we can't explain how they cause it to happen, let's just find out <laughs> what they are, which bits of the brain are responsible for making the lights come on, making the phenomenal lights come on. This inner world. Now, I think that's, that's a bad <laughs> research project because I, I don't think the inner lights do come on in that sense at all. I don't think there are inner lights of that kind. So looking for the correlates of them is is um, fool's errand. And also note the talk, the, the language, the correlates. Okay, I mean, You're not looking for explanatory yeah. mechanisms. You're looking for right. correlates. And of course, a correlate doesn't, exp- right. well, you know, correlate tells you something. Yeah, that happens when that happens. Yeah, but I don't still know that that happens when that, or even just that that causes yeah. that. I want to know why, <laughs> what's the relation yeah, between the two? How does it produce the, it? The so, consciousness is separate, to use that Yes, language. there's still a dualism yeah. implicit in the very use of the mm-hmm. word correlate. Anyway, so what sort of uh, projects do I'm, I like? Well, I, I'm, I'm, Let's start with I'm, sensory perception, uh, if, well, I, if that's okay. One approach that I'm, I think is very promising and that, I, that is definitely illusionist in spirit, though, again, its, um, it's leading advocate isn't too, key, isn't too keen on the name. He thinks it puts people off, though he's absolutely on board with the, with the, with the view, is um, uh, Michael Graziano's work on tension. Uh, and the modeling of attention. So it's not so, so much about the attentional processes that uh, direct perception. <laughs> uh, and he thinks that uh, the idea is that in order to control attention, the brain needs to model it. In order to control something, you need to have a model of the thing you're controlling. So it needs to model attention for the purposes of control. Model how attention... So it, it, there are these attentional system, uh, systems that have evolved. Okay? And they're in place and they direct, um, I guess, perceptual resources to different features that strike, um, that, that, that are interesting, that are saving. Something similar, something very simple might be, if I want to focus on my can of Coke, I move my eye to look at my eyes to look at it that sort of mechanism something that crew yeah but I'm, I'm thinking of not, not of the ones that are so much under you know deliberate control but that just i mean okay. it's, it's as an animal is moving around through the, the, its environment certain things will attract its attention things that that um will, will um i see it's bottom I up see. attention of that kind it's also top down sure. attention if it's if it's hungry saying it's looking for food maybe there are different sorts of attention anyway, I, we don't get into the details of this, but the point is that if the brain wants to control attention, I hope I'm getting this right, it needs to have a model of how these attentional processes work. And so it monitors the attentional processes and it creates a simplified schematic model of how they work, which present, which models attention as something like, uh, um, I, I, a little while since I read the papers, I hope uh, uh, his work on this, I hope I'm getting this right, which models the attention as something like a, it's like a fluid that flows out from our from our sense organs and attaches onto things in the world, um, and that is like a sort of ghostly fluid. That, I'm not sure if you use the word right. Like some um, that sort of energy that, that comes out and attaches, uh, focus, latches onto things in the world, and then has effects on us. 
and it models attention in this way, in this simplified, caricatured way, because that's a useful way of controlling attention. And then, of course, when we reflect and start to ask ourselves you know, about the nature of attention, about the nature of the sexual processes, we are tapping information from this model, which is already a caricature model of the actual processes. And so we tend to think of ourselves as having some sort of I'm not sure. I think I think he uses the word ghostly fluid, something like this. Some sort of non-physical um, uh, 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 um, sorry, I can't think of the right word. We tend to think of our minds as that's it, minds as being able to reach out to things in the world and to have a, a uh, effect upon us that is uh, unmediated by mechanisms and so on. There's this direct way of grasping, grasping information in the world and a direct way of this information affecting us and moving us like some ghostly spirit inside us. And that's how we get the, concept, the dualistic conception of, of the mind. From tapping information from the caricatured model of attention that our brains have created. And that wasn't really clearly explained, but I hope you get the basic idea. They, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's a simple the, the, the brain constructs simplified models of its own activity. We can access information from those models, and we get a caricature, a distorted idea of what our own minds are. Sure, sure. And that's the basic strategy. Now, that's related specifically to attention. I think we need something a bit broader. That is, I think that's part of probably part of the story. And I think we need something a bit broader that is also um, um, monitoring and modelling our reactions to uh, the things we're perceiving. So we're not just, um, experience isn't just a passive process in which information comes in and just sort of stops there in consciousness. Uh, it's, it's like, sometimes we think of things getting into consciousness as if that's, that's it. Well, it isn't it. I mean, we don't just want to take in information. We want to use the information. The information can affect us, move us. Can he use it? And it's in this reactive side of the process, I think, that the, the, the core of our sense of having a, an inner world resides. So I think what's happening is that, that the brain is modeling, continually modeling its own responses to perception. It's, um, um, it's continually modeling how stimuli are affecting it as across a huge range of dimensions and in doing that it's modeling if you like the significance of stimuli for us uh, is this is what we're perceiving is, is this is this a good thing for us or a bad thing for us well we, you can tell by seeing what reactions it's provoking uh, those reactions carry a huge amount of information about the nature of the of the, of the stimulus and so it's very useful to be able to mo monitor that, those reactions, model them in a simplified way. And then that gives you a perspective on your own experience and a perspective on the world. So you can tell people, you can tell other people, that's bad, don't touch that, because it has all this huge raft of effects on you. Now, you could, they could see that it was bad if they just watched you touch it and say something's hot or poisonous or something. They could mm -hmm. observe you touching it and reacting in that way, yes. But there's, now, if you can model those reactions internally and then report them, you can save them the time. You can say, "Just I can tell you it's bad now. It would create this huge raft of negative effects, and you don't need to try it yourself. You don't need to watch, observe somebody else trying it. I've tried it, and that's enough, and now I can tell you about it. So for social creatures, this ability to encapsulate the effects of experience in words would be immensely valuable. You'll be able to then um, um, use that information in, in your own planning. You'll be able to think, well, I'm, I must make a point of not of avoiding that thing again, or maybe of seeking out that other thing that produced this wonderful effect. So what, the idea is what we're capturing with our talk about what experience is like is the potency of things. Uh, or another word would be the affordances of things, the affordance term from the psychologist James Gibson. It's the, the, the idea that things afford us certain kinds of actions. They afford us responses. Um, in other words, they, they, 
um, induce, provoke certain kinds of uh, food, affords eating, <laughs> um, uh, affords taking and eating. Um, and of course, some things afford have negative affordances, therefore, you know, avoiding running away from them. Um, and what we're map, what we're uh, a system that monitored our react, our internal reactions to stimuli, this huge raft of psychological reactions to stimuli, would be in a sense be monitoring and modeling the affordances of things. And it would be immensely useful to have that. But again, we wouldn't need to have it in, have the information in minute detail. We need to know all the different dimensions of the, of the, um, of the reaction. We just have a general sense of its overall shape. Is it good or bad? Is it like that other kind of reaction? Is it it's more like that one than this other one? You know, just so we can locate it within a space of qualities, if you like. Um, just as you can locate colors in relation to other colors and so on. And create sounds and create pains links to other pains. And so you can give a relative um, a location in the space of these things. And you can tell other people about it. And you think about it. And that's what I think. It's those mechanisms that I think that are responsible for our sense of having this world of private qualitative properties. They're not really private. They're reaction, they're complex reactions occurring inside in, in our in our nervous systems. Um, but we monitor them in a, in a way that no one else can monitor them. And we model them and conceptualize them in a way that, that no one else does. Certainly a neuroscientist investigating them wouldn't um, um, be able to, wouldn't have, well, I suppose maybe they could in principle develop instruments that would model them in the same way, but certainly they, just, just by looking at them and doing brain scans and things, they wouldn't be modeling, monitoring and modeling them in the same way that we are, that, that our in, um, um, uh, brain systems are. And so the information about these reactions is packaged for us in a very special way, a way that's adapted to uh, the, the, the uses we put it to, to communication and to self-reflection and self-control. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same old information that a neuroscientist studying my brain could get laboriously through investigation of the processes occurring there. And it's repackaged in a really potent and powerful format that I can use. And we missed, and so again, the illusion is that this um, repackaged information about reactive complexity is actually uh, uh, information about some additional feature. So I was talking about a, 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 the kind of research program that I'd like to see, and it's one that um, has the same sort of structure as Graziano's thinking about the way that the brain models its own activity, but that extends it further um, to different, uh, to other aspects of, of um, uh, to, to the reactive side of perception. Uh, and oh, I, I guess we need to look at this from an evolutionary perspective. I was going to say that it's fair, I think it may be fairly evolutionary, evolutionarily recent in that I can't see why this sort of, this kind of information would be useful to, creatures who weren't social um, social animals who didn't want to who didn't have used to who, who didn't find it useful to share information about their internal condition their internal um, responses which isn't to say that non-human animals non-social animals are not conscious it's simply to say that they don't conceptualize their consciousness in the way that we do Something that you said that was quite fascinating to me that I'm not sure, though, if I'll be able to coherently uh, paraphrase and then I didn't coherently my... say it, so... <laughs> <laughs> and then attach my own thoughts to, which is, is that our minds can sort of interpret this complex uh, system of perception, etc., in a way that isn't available to other people. And what's fascinating to me about this is you said that, okay, perhaps a, a neuroscientist could come up with some sort of mm -hmm. mechanism that might, might represent it in, in a similar way. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly a brain scan wouldn't, uh, or an MRI machine. And mm -hmm. what's fascinating to me is that 
the tools that we've been using to try to get to what consciousness is might just be totally inept for the the task at hand. Of course, if we look at the brain with an MRI scanner, we're not going to be interpreting what's happening in the brain the same way that a mind does. But perhaps we could develop an apparatus that attaches your mind to my mind in the same way that our two hemispheres are attached by the corpus callosum. And in that sense, I might be able to observe what's happening in your mind hmm. as an outsider. So it could just be an entirely uh, technical technological problem. We just don't have the right machinery to look at the brain. And, mm -hmm. and that is part of what contributes to this uh, illusion of the hard problem. Mm. Yeah, well, we're certainly very early days. I mean, brain yeah. imaging is only, what, 40, 50 years old. Um, and it's still pretty crude, even though it's, it's improving. Um, it's, it's <laughs> very, very low resolution. And, um, have to take lots of different images and then and then um, um, do a sort of statistical analysis on them to get the pictures. Um, very, very, very crude. Um, uh, when you think about the immense complexity of the brain, 86 billion, massively interconnected. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. We're not dealing with nematode nervous systems <laughs> and even even those are elusive. <laughs> even those, the 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 even systems with a small number of, of neurons of, of processing units can have considerable complexity in the way they interact. And so if you think about the, the complexity of the human brain, I mean, it's, we're talking about a system that has evolved over thousands of millions of years. Um, uh, and I think, I think brain imaging gives us an, illu gives a, <laughs> gives an illusion, an illusion <laughs> of, 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 um, I mean, that would be too disparaging, by the way. It's telling us something, but I think it, it, it gives us the illusion of, of, of a greater degree of, of precision and understanding um, uh, and discrimination than, than we actually have. Uh, but it's, it's early days, very early days. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I, 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 I mean, this, I think, is the ultimate, the ultimate test <laughs> of whether there really is a hard problem is uh, how do our intuitions about this go in, say, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, assuming we're still flourishing and, uh, and uh, doing, uh, doing neuroscience? As we understand more and more about what is actually occurring when we're in these states we call pains and uh, other kinds of experience, um, as we understand more and more about what is happening there and about why we're inclined to talk about them in the way that we are, and we, we understand how our intuitions about these, the nature of these states are produced. Because when a philosopher reports that it feels, when the process, well, there's this, this ineffable feel to, the, to, to, their, to their experience, okay, they say that, you know, even if you were, if you have to ask what it's like, then you're never going to get to know. But why are they saying that? What is producing that report? Okay, well, it's going to, some, this, that report is being generated ultimately by some brain processes. And those brain processes presumably are responding to something. Okay, they, if, uh, if I say, I can feel a pain in my toe, that's because there's something distinctively happening, something happening inside me, in my both in my toe and in my nerve, central nervous system, and I'm somehow responding to that happening and issuing a report on it. And the more we know about how those reports are produced and how it is that we, why it is that we describe our experiences in the way that we do, we understand both what the, or about what the experiences are, what is actually occurring in the, in, in the nervous system, and how we are detecting and reporting that, uh, then I think... I think that our intuitions that there is anything further to explain than, than, than those processes will gradually, maybe not overnight, they will gradually fade away. And we will say, yeah, it sure does seem that there's something else happening, but it's not surprising given the way in which 
given the nature of the process, the, 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 the perceptual processes themselves, the sensory processes themselves, and the way in which um, uh, uh, our brains are monitoring uh, them and, and uh, prompting us to talk about them. And there may also be another aspect to this as well, which may be um, to do with culture and the role that culture plays in uh, shaping the way we talk about our minds. And there's, there, when I report that I'm in pain, there, there, there must be some sort of brain mechanism involved in detecting the state that I'm reporting. But how I report it, how I characterize it, Culture may play a huge role in shaping that, um, and shaping. Ones. What do you mean by that? Well, well. You mean like uh, we might say "ouch," and somebody in uh, some country in Africa might make a completely different sound. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe, but I think the way we conceptualize. Well, take. Um, well, let's make, let's make let's start with a, a completely un uncontroversial. Well, yeah, things are completely uncontroversial. Uh, let's take <laughs> right. an example that's fairly uncontroversial. Um, in the past, and well, still some people today, uh, pe some people thought that believe that um, people could be possessed by demons, and that these demons could control their thoughts uh, and emotions. And actions, but they were somehow in their minds, in their heads. And some people genuinely believe that they themselves were controlled by demons. And they believe that there was some malign entity that was somehow inside them and was making them do and say and feel things um, that they didn't want to. And so they would describe, if you ask them, why did you do that? Why did you say that? They would say, uh, that it's this demon making me say. Okay. Now, and similarly, they might, in, in private, they might have cert find certain thoughts going through their minds or images, perhaps of bad things, themselves doing bad things. And they might say, again, that's the demon making me say. Now, there's something going off in there. <laughs> there are certain things going occurring in there. When they have these thoughts, there's something occurring in some way, and there are some brain systems that are tracking that and that are prompting them to, to, to make these reports. So there's some physiological mechanism involved. There. But how they're conceptualizing it, how they're conceptualizing what's happening, is being shaped by a theory they've inherited. Um, so they're characterizing certain sorts of mental activity that they're aware of as being produced by some alien entity. And I think there's a much more benign form of that, I guess, which is we, it's quite tempting, I think, to think of ourselves as being as 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 something like little not demons, but there's like little entities that are that really there is there's that, 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 there's, there's me as the, the human being, the whole organism, but then the, the real me is not just not this thing, it's a sort of self <laughs> inside me that is doing the, that is where the real um self resides. That it's something that's animating me and producing my decisions and maybe my body reacts and my in all sorts of instinctive ways but the real thoughts and decisions are produced by this this, this inner me this self or soul or something like this and maybe this self or soul could, could survive the death of the body and that's another way of conceptualizing our minds that is obviously culturally shaped and it seems to me that we could have and similarly this way of talking about our minds as a private in a world filled with these qualities, phenomenal fields that are 
inexplicable in third person terms. That's another way of conceptualizing it. Again, all of these ways, all of these reports that we make are responding to something that's occurring within us. When I say things, you know, they're having this, the, the demon is putting this thought into my mind right now. Something's definitely happening and in some way I'm tracking it. Right. Uh, and when I'm uh, having the experience of saying I'm bright red at apple and, and, and I say that's producing red qualia in my mind, again, there's something happening. But again, I'm imposing a certain interpretation upon that. Now, maybe if we have um, children brought up in a, 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 a an environment where from birth they're taught neuroscientific concepts and theories and taught to think about when they try to describe what's happening to them and say, I've got this strange um, sensation. And the parent says, yes, that's because there's, there's, there's spiking activity in a certain region of your neocortex. And it's, You're it, reminding it's, me of Paul Churchland now. Yes. <laughs> and exactly. eliminative materialism and the propositional attitudes. Exactly. Yeah. There seems no reason why, we, why a, uh, um, a child couldn't be brought away, couldn't have a culture where everybody conceptualizes their minds in those terms. So it seems that, I mean, it's an interesting question to what extent certain ways of conceptualizing our minds are sort of hardwired in. And that certain features that are hardwired into the perceptual system, we, we see we, you know, the, the, our perceptual system hardwired to see um, edges and to interpret certain um, uh, Configurations of lines as indicating um, uh, depth, which is why perceptual illusions are powerful with us. Yeah, so, you know, you're, they're, they're like the Muller liar illusion, that certain hardwired features of the visual system that produce that illusion. Now, maybe there are certain hardwired features of our introspective systems that, that we can't uh, 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 as it were, see through. <laughs> Yeah. That um, even if we convince ourselves that they are illusory, we can't uh, reconcept. We can't get. We can't undo that conceptualization that is imposed by the by, by the introspective system itself. Some, Just that you can't, something that Im that so. immediately comes to mind is the sense that we're hearing our voices. Mm -hmm. Is that there's some sort of sound that seems like a very oh. good category for an introspective introspective illusion. You mean when we? Thinking, thinking when we're thinking we, we have the sense that we're hearing sound mm -hmm. internally yes well there very likely is uh some in, in, uh, in uh involvement interaction with the, the... Of, of the auditory system and perhaps the articulatory system mm -hmm. and the um, phonological systems in these in these processes so we're not completely wrong <laughs> um there is something going off there that, that is very like what's going off when you're <laughs> when you're hearing um mm -hmm. Uh, but again, our, I suppose you could say that my, my whole case here is that the way we think about the mind is um, maybe wrong, <laughs> or mm -hmm. at least not utterly wrong, but maybe distorted in all kinds of ways, both by um, biology, both by Light evolved uh, um, uh, neural systems and by culture. And that's, I mean, I, I, I suppose I could extend the, the idea of illusionism to many other aspects of our uh, self conception. Uh, certainly I would say that it's an illusion to think that there is a self separate um, um, that somehow um, distinct from the, 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 the biological organism. I would also say it's an illusion to think that we have the kind of free will that many people think we have, but the free will that could actually um, that is X can somehow override the, the physical causal nexus and yeah. Can I press you on that a little bit? Yeah, uh, sure. I, I mean, I, I always enjoy talking about free will and hearing different mm -hmm. people's views on it. So if that is this sort of 
independence from the causal architecture of the world mm. is not the sort of free will that we have, which I'm, I'm quite happy to grant. Uh, what is the sort of free will that you think we do have, if there is such a mm. thing? Well, <laughs> what are we doing with it? when we talk about free will? We're talking about our ability to control things, to make decisions about how things are going to um, going to go. I said, I, I'm going, okay, I'm going to decide we're going to raise my arm. And I did, you know, I, I can control that. That's um, that's what, that, that, that happens. Okay. You know, we have certain kinds of self-control. We are, um, thanks to these massively complex um, organs in our heads, we can control all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, though that <laughs> That um, that sort of control doesn't require uh, 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 any uh, freedom from necessitation by physical causes. In fact, it relies on it because these processes only work because they, uh, you know, the processes in my the mechanisms in my head that give me control of things only work because of. Uh, the the, um, uh, the laws of nature are are are, are consistent, and the mechanisms follow them. Um, it seems though to me like you might be helping yourself to the idea of an illusion when it when it suits you, like with regard to consciousness, but. It also seems like it, like by that same token, free will should be an illusion in the sense that everything, it, in the in the sense that things might be, we might live in a deterministic universe. Uh, in that case, uh, it it does seem like it would fit your schema for some sort of an illusion. But if we don't live in a deterministic universe. Uh, then there is randomness that also doesn't seem to give us free will. So I wonder if if you why you wouldn't classify free will in either of these two cases as still some sort of an illusion, because we might feel like we are making our arms move. But if this was already determined millennia ago that it was going to happen, then we seem like we ought to be categorizing that as an illusion of agency. If you have a conception of free will that is incompatible with um, determinism, and assuming determinism holds, then I would say that it's that it's that it's illusory. But um, I don't think, and so I would say that um, the libertarian conception, the libertarian free will as libertarians conceive of it, is illusory. Um, it's a matter of, it's not a matter of saying that free will is illusory or not, or indeed that consciousness is illusory or not. It's a matter of saying that certain conceptions, that, uh, um, that um, consciousness as conceived of in certain ways, as we will as conceived of in certain ways, is illusory. Um, sure. Again, there's, when the stage magic case, there's definitely something happening there. It's not that there's, it's, when you go to the magic show, you're not seeing nothing. <laughs> it's just not seeing what you think you're seeing. Uh, I, I've never really understood why, um, when you when we think about uh, what it is to be agents, what, what kind of uh, what it is to act freely, I've never understood why that should be incompatible with the truth of determinism. Assuming for the sake of argument that determinism is true, I mean, the things that stop me from acting freely are uh, there's, all, there's all kinds of things that can stop me from acting freely. External constraints of people you know, preventing me from from uh, from moving or threatening me uh, if I do something. As internal constraints, I might be afraid to do the thing I really want to do. I might. Just, I might too anxious to make the decision that I want to, and that would be a constraint in my field. There's all sorts of things I can do. I might have taken a, some uh, some drug that prevents me from thinking clearly or acting decisively. All sorts of things that 
interfere with my ability to act freely. But, but the truth of global determinism doesn't seem to be one of them. It's not that, you know, that someone says, well, yes, but I, I say, hey, look, I, 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 I freely chose to do that. And someone says, to me, yes, but, you know, you do know that in the end, all of that was the product of massively complex processes in your, in your brain that were in turn responses to massively complex processes in your environment, which were in turn responses to the, the causal products of previous states of the environment and so on and so on. And all of this um, unfolded according to some um, kind of deterministic playbook. Well, well, maybe it did, but still, it was what I call a free action. <laughs> you know, I can recognize when I'm acting freely and when I'm not. And I'm not take, in, in recognizing that and saying, that's, that's what I call a free action. This raising my hand, that's a, that was a free action. I did it because I wanted to make a philosophical point. I'm, I'm not... There's no assumption built into that that it wasn't the product of 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 of, uh, uh, of causal processes that were ultimately outside my control. I, mean, I don't have to control everything to control something. I mean, it's really just taking seriously the idea that we are part of the world, that that some causal processes are constitute us, <laughs> and if the ones that are occurring in me and uh, if, if, if the relevant causal processes are happening within me, then that makes them my causal processes. Yeah. They don't I think need to be that, somehow doing something different from other causal processes. It's, yeah, I, I think I, that perfectly encapsulates what I would want to say. And you, so yeah. you put it really nice. Because, I mean, I, I don't take the devil's advocate position that I um, uttered when I pose the question to you but i really think that that perfectly sums it up that if the, the relevant causal processes occur in me then they're mine yeah and so so that it's, was a really nice way of putting it. i think there is i think that i think there is a dualistic intuition at the heart of these worries about free will that i am not really my brain so if my brain did it then i didn't really do it mm -hmm. <laughs> um but that is i <laughs> you you never get off a um um uh, a charge of uh, a criminal charge by saying, well, you know, my brain processes made me do it. You might, if you said those brain processes have been interfered with in some unnatural way by, 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 by drugs or something like that. But just saying, no, my regular standard brain processes that produce all my behavior produce this, but so I'm not guilty. No, you are. <laughs> those brain processes make you. And if, you, the whole embodied organism in which those brain, pro those brain processes are occurring, um, um, if, if, if the embodied organism that those brain processes control did it, then you did it, because there's, you are that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. No, that was great. Now, we, we went on a big tangent. Yeah. This, all, this all started when I when you began answering my question about literature and psychology, cognitive science, neuroscience, and then we went into uh, the research program you would like to see. Right, and right. before we move on to that, I, ha I have in mind a, a more particular question. And if there, the question is roughly, are there any particular studies in psychology or cognitive science or neuroscience that you draw on as supporting the sort of position you've outlined as illusionism so one one thing that immediately comes to mind you're, i'm sure you're familiar with it that uh, daniel dennett uh, references often is this experiment that you can perform yourself with a playing card uh where we we have this idea uh maybe it, i mean it's not really maybe it's not the sort of illusion that you have in mind for illusionism but we have this idea that we see color all around us this is for obviously people who aren't um, you <laughs> who are listening, but there you can look it up, but there's a sort of experiment that you can do with a playing card where if you start holding it sort of outside your field of vision, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and yeah. you slowly move it inward um, towards your focal point, you don't actually see the color or, or know what the card is until it's very close. Um, to the center of your field of vision. So the the inner perceptual uh, view we have of the world is is not what we think it is. Um, but so are there any 
uh, relevant pieces of the literature that you take as supporting the research program, other than the the attention mm. stuff that we I think that, we started uh, off there, with? There, there are masses of them. Um, I'm I'm mainly focused on addressing the philosophical arguments, and so I'm, I, um, okay. And so I I don't cite these as much as as perhaps I could or should. Um, certainly, Dennis, as you say, references many of them in his work. I mean, the particularly interesting work is work on change blindness. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with with that. The, the, the you will um, uh, in these experiments you are you you've shown a a, a um, little video say. And the, you will see a, a static picture. And typically, you see a, static, a certain picture, colored picture, say, of a, a scene. And then there'll be a momentary interruption, a blank screen or gray screen or something else. And then the picture will reappear. But something will have changed in the picture, something quite signif significant. Uh, uh, the roof of the house in the picture will be a different color or some element in the picture will have disappeared. Um, so there'll have been a change in the picture. But because of the interruption, even though the interruption's only been a fraction of a second, you don't notice it. You miss it. You just don't see it. You're blind to it. And you'll say, no, it's, it still looks the same. And it can take really many viewings before you actually realize what it was that changed. Another... Uh, even more subtle form is one where it's a the, the image there's a continual change in the image. You're looking at a scene and uh, say one of the, one of the colours colour of, of, of some region changes subtly, not not, not so all at once, just gradually. So that by the end, it's a completely different colour to what it was at the beginning. But you don't notice. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin O'Regan has some wonderful examples of these on his the. Um, has um, some wonderful examples of these on his uh, website. Now, these do pose, I think, a, a problem for people who want to say that they know what the they know what it's like to be them. Because what was happening? But while you were, say you were watching the one that gradually, where the color gradually changes, and you don't notice it. Well, what was happening to your your qualia. What, what was it like for you to be experiencing that region of the of the image? Uh, the, the color was changing, but you weren't noticing the change. So, were your qualia changing? Was it still was what it was like at the end the same as what it was like at the beginning? Uh, even though the mm. color had completely changed, and presumably the change had been registered at some level by your visual system. Uh, yeah. Or did your qualia change, but you didn't notice they'd changed? In which case, how can qualia be what it's like for you? Because if you don't notice what it's like for you, then what sense is it like it for you? <laughs> um, so these these are the sort of considerations that Dennett uses to put pressure on this mm -hmm. notion of, of qualia as something that they're immediately presented to us and that constitute the immediate reality of our perceptual world because if they did <laughs> then we should be able to answer these questions we should be able to say with authority that either my qualia changed or they didn't change and in fact as he, it's a really nice chapter i think it's chapter four of his book 2005 book is it uh, called sweet dreams and, and i like that book it, uh, it, you know you know the book yeah yeah i've read it uh, he it's has some really good book. Uh, responses i think to Maybe it's the Mary in the White Room argument in there. there it's a um, thought experiment. It, yeah, yeah. There, there, it's 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 a series of um, essays. Some of them, as you say, responding to um, to responses to his own work, and some of them developing some of the ideas in the early work. It's it's a, it's a wonderful book. I strongly recommend it. And these, uh, I was going to say thought experiments. He does use thought experiments, imaginary cases, but that is that is that is a real piece of. of um, a um, real psychological um, uh, effect, um, well established in, under experimental conditions, and these put pressure on the idea that we do know 
what it's like to be us. And the point of his of his um, uh, analysis of these cases is that you're left having to make a theoretical decision about what to say about your choir. It's not immediately given to you what you should say in response to these questions. So it turns out that the notion of choir isn't this innocent, oh, it's just what it's like. It's No, it's, some, it's a theoretical notion that you're imposing upon whatever deliverances introspection provides you with. And it's highlighting the fact that introspection is limited in ways you didn't realize. Just as the, right. the point about the card is that, that, that you made, we, as you say, we tend to think that it's all richly colored and detailed all the way out there. And a very simple experiments will demonstrate that it isn't. That's an interpretation you're imposing on, on introspection. And as Danny points out, there, there are many of these. And uh, uh, he also likes, uh, also highlights the role that memory plays in, uh, in our reports. If I say, uh, if you say to me, has have all the colours around you, have all your, your colours, colour experience changed in the last, since we started this interview? The red things still look the same to you now as they did at the beginning of the interview. Well, I'd say, yes, of course they do. I just like this red over there. It's the, I, there's a red thing over there. I can see it and it looks the same as it did. Well, yes, but that assumes that my memory of what it used to look like uh, is accurate. What if uh, my qualia, my the, the actual feel of experience has changed? Right, I've read experience has changed completely over that hour, but I forgot. I've misremembered what it used to be like. So memory mm-hmm. plays an essential role in these judgments about what it's like too. All emphasizing, the, highlighting the fact that there's a huge theoretical element to our introspective reports. Right. There's a a, a a very relevant experiment. And I think I've mentioned it on this, on the podcast before, but it's probably been a while. Uh, There's a philosopher, Diane Raffman, and Mm -hmm. she has a paper on a psych, on the psychologistic account, I suppose, of Sorides paradoxes. And she points to these experiments in which let's just say you have 50 color splotches, uh, Mm -hmm. And they're red on one side and orange on the other side. And you start with the red one, you ask, is this orange? And they'll say no. But as you go one by one, eventually there will be an arbitrary cutoff point where the person will say, yes, this is um, orange. And But the interesting part is that if you start off the same way, but you show the uh, the the color squares pairwise and you say is this orange they will get all the way to the other end where it is orange and they will still say no and yeah, so that's very fascinating and what she what she proposes is that there are are two mechanisms in the brain uh the i think it's the maybe the distinguisher and the categorizer and yeah. in the first case the categorizer if you think of them as homunculi, has free reign, and each time the person sees a swatch and the categorizer uh, determines, oh, is this orange or is this red, and makes the decision. But when they're shown pairwise, it's the distinguisher, the, st- the distinguisher homunculus that has free reign, and each time they're the same, so they're never going to acknowledge that. I mean, they're the the colors are so re- similar that the distinguisher will never say, well, these are different. So. Uh, it's it's it again contributes to this idea that there is an allusion to how we uh, perceive qualia, and it illustrates and how um, knowledge of how perception works can influence how we interpret our own, how we describe our own inner lives. We can we can take account of these effects in describing. There's no reason at least why we can't take account of these effects and that distinction that you just made in describing, in thinking about the way we make similarity judgments and notice mm-hmm. perhaps cases where we are misled by it. Mm-hmm. Um, again, it's it's like it's similar to the to the to the point about free will. Actually, that it's it's just taking seriously that we are just evolved biological organisms, because if we are, then we won't have any magical 
infallible access to our own nature, including, you know, to what's going on in here. What's going on, if we are just biological, then what's going on in here is as much, <laughs> is as much in need of representation and interpretation as the rest of the world. We, we know more, we're no more certain about what's happening in this bit of the world than we can be about that bit of the world. Everyone accepts we can be under, uh, under illusions about the world around us. We can misrepresent that in all sorts of ways, and perception, we know that perception does. It's highly selective, for one thing. We have a sense of very narrow um, a band of electromagnetic radiation, the, the, uh, the visual spectrum. It's highly selective and distorting. It's adapted for... Um, uh, it's been um, shaped, sculpted by evolution for uh, to be to be useful. Um, similarly, what about this bit of the world that's inside here? Again, our, our awareness of it is going to be partial and distorted and selective and shaped by evolution for uh, uh, just to suit our, our, our needs. It's mm -hmm. the idea that we could have. Uh, I want to say magically, and I will say mag magically, immediate and perfect awareness of stuff that's happening in here is quite out of how to sync with the idea that we are just evolved biological mechanisms. Yes. It's, it's, it's dualism again. There's a dualist intuition at the heart of it. Now, I, just to clarify before we move on, the sort of experiments we've been talking about this is part of a strategy more following Dennett to put pressure to use your word, uh, or it's a, it's a negative argument against the, the radical realists rather than a positive argument in favor of the, the illusionist, or do you think it serves <sighs> both purposes? It's, um, hmm, uh, I, I suppose, I suppose each both serve the same the same purpose an argument as far as it's an argument against that position and this is the only alternative that's in our favor of this one. Okay. Um, um, sure. we, you know, that comes back to my earlier point about there not being really a middle ground. Um, I, I take it what those arguments are trying to do is to unpick the is to is, is to uh, not to argue on general theoretical grounds that there probably is some sort of illusion here but to actually unpick the illusion itself and to show you uh, elements of illusion in your own introspective world, which would then, I see. Um, okay. which would then, I guess, um, loosen you up to the idea that, um, right. that, that there may be a, um, a more systematic illusion. Because people right. will uh, say, yeah. in response to that, they'll say, okay, yeah, change minus, that's a bit, that's a bit funny, but... I definitely know that I'm experiencing this this red patch here right now, and I know what it's like right at this moment. I might be wrong about what it was like a few moments ago, but I know what it's like right now, here and now. So of course, if you right. start to dig down into that, and certain meditative techniques can enable you to do that, you find that that's not quite as as uh, that's a bit more elusive than you thought it might be. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one thing I would want to do in those cases, in these cases, is to start picking um. um and I've, I've tried to do this a, a couple of thought, ex, some thought experiments, is to try and pick away at the... Let's take pain. Pain is the example that I, that I, that I use. People say, well, pain, that's vivid, that's real, it's present, it's here, it's now, I completely know what it is. And it's just immediately wholly present to me. And then I try to pick away at that by saying, okay, well, but pain involves... Um, when you're in pain, you also have certain beliefs and desires. For instance, you believe that your, your body is, is in distress. You have a desire, a wish for the state you're in now, the condition you're in now to stop. So let's just imagine those not being present. Take those away. So you've still got the pain, but you no longer wish it to stop. You no longer believe that your body has been harmed. You're no longer you no longer judge that something bad is happening to you. You're no longer worried about your condition. Um, you no longer um, you're no longer seeking relief from the condition. You in fact tend to say no. It can let it continue. You, the, the, all the reactions associated with pain, we gradually dismantle them, remove them. You no longer it's no longer producing. It's no longer evoking um, 
memories of previous traumatic incidents. It's, no, it's not provoking anxiety about the future and the, the, the consequences of this, whatever it is that's happening to you. I said you don't want it to stop. It's not prompting you to behave in any way. It's not, it, it, you don't feel any uh, urge to m move away from whatever's the source of the, 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 the disturbance is, or you don't feel inclined to change the position of your body in any way to get relief from it. Take away all of these reactions, bit by bit by bit, unpick them all, and what's left? Now, it seems that the, you know, the, the quality of realists say, well, all the pain would still be left in all its vividness and reality when you'd taken all those away. Um, I don't know. I think I don't share that intuition. Um, and I have a, um, a little thought experiment involving anesthetics that I like to do. Would, would you like to hear my thought? Yeah, 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 I'd love to hear it. Okay, uh, so first, going... first, though, before you get into it, um, yeah. something that you've pointed to that I find quite fascinating is mm -hmm. there is a very particular difficulty that as an illusionist you face mm -hmm. in convincing your audience, which is that consciousness is so multifaceted. I mean, mm -hmm. there's pain, there's color, there's the internal voice, there are so many things. And every time you make a can you you draw on a convincing thought experiment like say like the, uh, not a, an actual experiment or thought experiment like the card you sort of cut off one hydra's head <laughs> but they're just there it's just going to take such a comprehensive account yeah. and to really convince people to the point where they're like well darn it i can't think of any more um allusions to or any more facets of consciousness to try to poke holes in but so i think that that's something that's very it's very fascinating that this is a maybe a unique problem for the illusionist framework and why it has been hard to be convincing even though i i mean i find it uh quite compelling mm -hmm. uh but anyway the yeah, anesthetic well, i suppose experiment. i suppose my answer to that is well well it would seem like that wouldn't it um mm -hmm. uh, we are we have very rich perceptual systems um Systems of the ex exteroception, systems of bodily awareness, interoception, we have pain systems, systems of proprioception, or we have a vast array of, of, of sensory systems, and they're all multi-dimensional. Um, um, we're pretty, pretty sophisticated things. I mean, if we were just... <laughs> The um, most sophisticated things. <laughs> yeah, we are, yeah. And uh, I, so, and if, if we are, if our brains are also tracking these very sophisticated processes and giving us some sort of um, uh, limited, distorted access to them, it's not surprising that we would be in this state that you mentioned. Um, I suppose the idea is that you 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 make a case, and I suppose this is one trying you make a general case for the view on, on on grounds of theoretical simplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, you make a then you make uh, and you support that by particular examples, particular um, case studies um, that um, uh, offer some support for it. You. You pick away at the at the uh, the notion of immediate infallible awareness that's supposed to gra that grounds that, that's central to this intuition that we know what it's like to be us that there's no mediation involved there's no no room for misrepresentation you you, you work on many different um, fronts fight on many different fronts right uh, yeah. and increasing i suppose you're informed by by, by neuroscience as it, as it as it develops but i think and, that there now we're getting into sort of metaphilosophical concerns yeah, and yes, the yes. the the problem though that i still think illusionism is going to have is that it doesn't matter if you have a correct theoretical argument uh that isn't going always going to do the job of convincing people uh it's sort of like in the philosophy of math in math not the philosophy of math you can have 
perfectly correct proofs, but that doesn't mean that there won't be disagreement on it just because of how complex it is or how how far abstracted it is from our intuitions. And our intuitions about consciousness are so strong that even if you have the correct argument, that doesn't mean it's going to be convincing. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think having all of the experimental evidence at hand to sort of cut down the hydras of objections uh, to this unintuitive argument are going to be so helpful in convincing. Certainly, certainly, I agree. But remember that this is where I think people criticize me for using the word illusion, but I think I think it's exactly the right word. Remember that because the analogy is with something like a perceptual illusion, like the Muller Lyre illusion, where the two arrows, the two lines seem to be a different length because the arrow heads are pointing in different directions at the, at the end of them. Optical illusions like that are very, very powerful, and they remain powerful even when you absolutely convinced intellectually that they are illusions. Mm-hmm. Even when you know those two lines are exactly the same, when you've measured them, they still look different. Um, um, and it's not, and we may not be able to, as it were, cognitively penetrate this this illusion of phenomenality. That's Even a good that's way of how it. The, that's how the brain presents itself to itself. That's just how it, the brain looks to itself when it looks at itself, if you like. Um, uh, so the intuitions, the gut feeling, <laughs> so is always going to be there, and you're not going to get rid of it. The question is persuading people um, not to trust it and not to uh, go off down what I think are philosophical and scientific dead ends, um, uh, not to waste, waste, ultimately not to waste time on... Uh, 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 projects that are based on intuitions that are no more reliable than the intuition that the two lines in the Muller liar illusion are different. And so that is really an intellectual project. In the end, it's not getting people to, to cease to be under the illusion. It's getting people not to cease to trust it and to cease to, to waste time um, uh, uh, on, on uh, uh, projects that, that, that arise from trusting it. And I, I think this is one, one reason why I'm, I, I, think, I think Dennett's work on this is wonderful because he doesn't, it's not, some people I think are frustrated because Dennett's work, that Dennett doesn't, always, doesn't present sort of uh, formal arguments, you know, with premises and uh, deductive arguments with premises and conclusions and you know, sort of bulletproof logic. Because that's not, that's not what he's trying to do. He's trying to get you to look at the whole thing from a different perspective. Um, he's, you can't, if, when you're asking someone to, 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 to adopt a different worldview, a different perspective on the whole um, subject, you, you're not going to do it by deductive argument. You've got to present the attractions of that view. You've got to say, come over here, look at it from this perspective, and then see how different things look. See how mm-hmm. different the landscape looks and how more, how better it looks, how things fit together so much better from over here. Uh, and you don't have this strange sort of weird spike in the, what seemed like a strange weird spike in the landscape, this, this, this hard problem. Look at it from over here and it doesn't seem like that at all. It seems just like a gentle... <laughs> Uh, I haven't really thought this metaphor through, but things that seemed <laughs> anomalous from that strange viewpoint. There's a wonderful example that um, an, uh, psychologist Nicholas Humphrey uses in his book Sold Us, which I continually recommend to everyone, and indeed his new book Sentience. But here's this example of uh, the impossible triangle. It's, I'm sure you've seen it. it, it you, it's a, a two-dimensional drawing uh, of an apparently three-dimensional shape in which the Angles of the three, um, it's a triangle like this with sort three. Sort of Escher esque. Yes, exactly. Escher. But it, it's, it's the three sides bend back on each other in a way that they couldn't right. do in reality. It's a it's perfectly um, the um, clearly triangle. drawn figure that couldn't exist in reality, at least the way we interpret it. We interpret it as an impossible three dimensional object. Now, you can actually build a real physical three dimensional object that looks like that from one very particular angle that looks like a real three-dimensional uh, 
impossible triangle. It's it's a really ungainly construction with the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. one arm coming out like this and then another one coming out there and then a sort of hole cut in the end of one of the pieces where you're to reach you're to align with the end of the other one. And from, it, from almost every angle, it looks just like a weird, ungainly construction of three pieces of wood, but you turn it to exactly the right angle and the sides line up and the end piece lines up with the gap in the... In, um, uh, well, the end of one piece lines up with the gap in the end of the other, and it looks like a real three-dimensional impossible triangle. Now, I think people, uh, I think, and, and so Nick's analogy is that the brain is presenting its own activity to itself, to, as it were, from this strange angle that makes it look magical and impossible. But from every other angle, it just looks like this, this, this perfectly uh, uh, possible but ungainly thing. And that's how the brain looks from the perspective of neuroscience. And that's what, what it really is. It's just there's one very strange angle from which it looks different. And so the project then is getting to try and go back to the to the um, to the question. The project is getting people to move away from that angle, from that perspective from which it looks strange, and see that there are other perspectives. And at least, at least to appreciate that there are these other perspectives, even if yeah. they refuse uh, to adopt them. What I like about this is that uh, on a metaphilosophical level, I mean, you're pointing to the fact that I think we often forget in contemporary analytic philosophy is that the, there's more than one way to uh, write a philosophy paper or, paper or attack a philosophical project than just spelling out an argument with premises and a and a conclusion and maybe it gets back to a more human way of doing philosophy where we where it's more holistic we're just trying to uh, convince people of something and show show them different ways of thinking i couldn't agree more uh that um that formal logical presentation is just a bit of rhetoric in the end um mm -hmm. all the work is done in the defense of the premises the fact that you've arranged the thing into the form of a deductive argument adds nothing to it mm -hmm. it does in fact it often serves i think to hide implicit assumptions the work is always in the premises and when you get down to it it's there's a reliance in the end why should you accept the premises well in most philosophical arguments it comes down to very often to intuition uh, in other cases, to some inference to the best explanation or integrations of simplicity, or just, you know, it's just neater that way or whatever. The appearance of rigor that is generated by putting it in a form of a deductive argument, I think, is often spurious and, um, and, I, uh, and I, 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 I know we're having a thunderstorm, and uh, <laughs> I. Uh, Attention. I think unhelpful. It, 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 it's, it can be alienating to some readers. I think it can be, it can give an undeserved impression of authority uh, because you, know, you, know, you can't challenge that logic, can you? And it doesn't engage, it doesn't conduct the debate at the right level, which is often, I mean, so it was, if you're in a research symposium in a university, um, you know, someone's speak, a guest speaker has come to present a paper, you'll, they'll present the paper and then it'll be open to questions and immediately everybody will leap on particular points in the argument uh, where they think there may have been um, something may have proceeded too swiftly or there may have been um, uh, some ambiguity or um, uh, failure to make a point distinction or perhaps the question whether this is this move, this, this argumentative move really works, and so on. Get very technical detail, and this will go on for quite yeah. a long time. And right. then, when this has kind of worked itself out, people will then start gravitating to the what's really going on, and they'll say, "Yes, but all this, so it's all very well. Yes, and I can see you've got responses to all those technical points. But what's really going on here is that you're assuming you're trusting that, aren't you? And I don't think that's right. And they'll bring out the underlying." assumptions that are shaping the way the whole thing has been presented and then by the end you get down to basically sort of table thumping on one side saying well yeah but i do trust that intuition and the other side saying well i don't and then you all stop and go go to the pub um 
and I think it's often much more helpful, especially if you're doing philosophy with a with a wider audience, a more inclusive audience, just to get those assumptions out in the open at the turn, at the beginning, and, and ask what the big picture is here. Um, uh, we spend too much time finessing the fine details and not enough time worrying about the, um, you know, we're doing the, you know, the fine details of the of the of, of the architectural decoration, and not enough time worrying about whether the foundations are going to stand up. Sorry, that's a little rant there. I'm not, I, I think. No, 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 no. You kind nice. of uh, <laughs> nice sort of invite you, 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 you sort of invited me to do it, and then I went off into it. But I do feel that oh. way, and I feel it's off putting for for um, people outside um, uh, the philosophical profession. They, they they find it intimidating, and it's it's not necessary a lot of the time. No, I'm not saying there's no use for this, and it can be very useful to to precisify things. But um, it doesn't go to the heart of the matter. Can we return to the anesthetic thought experiment? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I did very much enjoy your rant, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I'm not sure quite what triggered that. I wasn't really expecting to, to do that. Um, oh, maybe I struck a chord, which is good. I think you did. And uh, in some ways, I, 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 I operate on the fringes of of academia and I, I do try to engage with a wider audience one reason I like doing these podcasts I think it's very important, philosophy is far too important I think to be left to the philosophers who will bury it um, not all of these issues are of great importance everyday importance but many of them are I think getting a clear perspective on our own minds what minds are and on the minds of other creatures and understanding what we can and cannot know about the minds of other creatures. I think this is incredibly important. And bearing it under technicalities isn't, isn't helpful. Anyway, go back to the example. Okay. So, um, so the idea is, is pain, pain, is pain really, when you, is the, the kind of pain that matters to us? Which is it? Is it some just pure, unstructured feeling? It's just immediately present to you? Or is it just a cluster of psychological reactions of various kinds? The kinds that a zombie would have. He doesn't have this... This... Um, he's, who's, who's, brain processes are not accompanied by this, this, this pure qualitative um, feel. So here's the example. You're going to have an operation, and the operation's going to cause a lot of pain. And you're offered a choice of two anesthetics. Let me make sure I get this right. Now, the first anesthetic will stop. The, let's just assume for the sake of argument that there are there really are these two aspects. There really, there really is this intrinsic feel, and then there are all the reactions, all the cost of excellence. Okay? Now, the first anesthetic will kill the pure feel of the pain, but it will leave all the reactions intact. So the first one, it kills the, the, the pure feel, the quality of pain, but it leaves intact all the reactions. So you're still going to believe that you're in pain because that's one of the reactions to pain. You're going to still going to want, desperately want pain, the, 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 the state <laughs> you're in to stop. You're going to have all the physiological reactions to pain. You're going to be sweating, your heart's going to be pounding, your adrenaline levels are going to be peaking, your stress hormones are going to be high. You're going to be struggling. And your body's going to be twisting and turning and trying to get out, out of this. It's going to be create, it's going to be conjuring up memories of traumatic events in the past. And it's going to be leaving you with traumatic memories of something that's happened right now. It's going to trigger worries about what this awful thing is going to do to you. You're going to feel that some, something, you're going to believe that something utterly terrible is happening that's going to destroy your life. All of this, all of these reactions. And I go, you can go on telling this story in immense detail because the, the reactions that are produced by bodily damage 
uh, across physiological, uh, psychological, and behavioral levels, it's huge. And all those are going to be intact. So as far as the surgeon is concerned, it's going to be exactly as if you've had no anesthetic whatsoever. Okay. So uh, now the other anesthetic does exactly the opposite. It kills all of those reactions. You don't believe you're in pain. You don't want what's happening to you to stop. You don't have any fears, any anxieties. Your heart rate is perfectly normal. You're perfectly... Um, uh, you, you, you don't, stress levels are not increased. You don't have any fears. You're not having any bad memories. You're, you're, you're not uh, recalling any, you're not having, uh, recalling any um, bad memories and you're not forming any new ones. Um, you're just lying there perfectly peacefully for all intents and purposes. And you're mm -hmm. perfectly peaceful inside insofar as all psychological reactions are concerned, things that can be defined in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, in functional terms, in, term, in, in, in so far as your um, mental state can be characterized in, term, in, in terms of functional processes. But there isn't this awful, awful quality to it. And now, then you have to choose which would you take, and assume you can't take both. Um, now, Phenomenal realist, I guess. The person who thinks that quality are the heart of that the quality of pain is the heart of what pain is. Will have to say, well, they would, they would take the first one. Um, but if you're under any, at least, if you feel any hesitation about it, then I think that shows that phenomenal realism perhaps isn't as compelling as some people think it is. Hmm. But maybe when you Maybe when we talk about the feel of pain, when we talk about we talk about pain, we're just packaging together our our, 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 our sense of all those reactions occurring, and that's all there is to it. Hmm. So it's it's designed not perhaps to convince people that illusionism is true, but to convince them that perhaps it's not as straightforwardly true as they might think that phenomenal realism is the right approach. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think it's it's a good time to shift away. I mean, there are there are a lot of I still had a lot more that I wanted to talk about regarding illusionism. I wanted to talk about panpsychism. I wanted to talk about your work in folk psychology, but then we would just be here for six hours. Uh, but there is one last thing oh, maybe we'll do. Time. Yeah, maybe we'll do. Maybe we'll talk about those things another time. I would be interested to talk now, about the folk psychological stuff because that's something I've not. Uh, worked on for a while but I, I do want to get back to it okay then great uh but before that there is something that i want to talk about which is that i i was perusing around your website and i saw that you have a, a section um devoted to poetry readings and it's funny <laughs> uh i interviewed your your colleague uh sophie grace chappelle <laughs> a few <laughs> weeks ago and we had a wonderful conversation and one of my favorite parts of that conversation was she gave a, a brilliant reading of Gerard Manley Hopkins, I, I Wake and Feel the Fell of Dark, Not Day. And we also talked about a poem you've done a, a reading of, For I Will Consider My Cat Joffrey. Mm. Uh, but I was smart. curious, I found, I found this really interesting. Do you write poetry or do you only do readings of it? Do write it. I do write it. I don't... Um... I don't share it much. Maybe that's something I should start doing. Yes, I do. I do. And I, I enjoy... I, I, it seems... I, I'm quite happy to call myself a philosopher, even though that seems a rather... Uh, arrogant label in some ways. I'm a philosopher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. That's a, um, but I'm happy to call it. Calling yourself a poet, that seems to me even more elevated. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think to be a poet. I, I understand. I would love to be able to call myself a poet, but I feel well. Yes, I write poems. I do write poems. Yeah. But am I really a poet? Am I actually? Are these really poems, or are they just, you know, stuff that Keith writes that is kind of his? Yeah. You know. So I feel in a way much more intimidated by poetry. I think maybe it's that I 
you see, I wouldn't go on a rant about about, about poetry. I do. I maybe I have, have too maybe too much, or perhaps not too much. I certainly have very high um, uh, esteem for poetry and poets, um, and it's very important to me. And I do enjoy reading it very much. Um, Hopkins is an absolute favourite of mine. Um, so after my father died, I read um, his poem, no, the one that begins, no, no Worse, There Is No Worse. And it, I just, it, it's, it's, it gives you a language for things that, that are inexpressible in other ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it gives you a way of, I was going to say objectifying. It gives you a way of coming to terms with things, I think, that you can't come to terms with in other ways. You find it articulated there, or you, you, if you're talented enough, you articulate it yourself. And that makes it more comprehensible, more apprehensible, more live withable, more bearable, yeah. is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Because I suppose it's because it's being communicated, because you're feeling that here you're touching someone else. This is perhaps, the, we talk, you talked earlier about neural interfaces. This is perhaps the best thing we've got for that at the <laughs> yeah, moment. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Um, I hmm. felt a sort of communion, I suppose, communion, yeah, contact with people like Hopkins that helped me immensely. And I don't know of any other th- other way that well you can yes the only other way is 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 is, is with people who are you are really really close to and you develop a really really intimate relationship with and then that is something similar but with poetry you can do it with with, with people you never met um, mm-hmm. and I would burn every bit of philosophy I've ever written to write a, po- a poem like uh, poets and a few poems like. Hopkins sonnets. Mm-hmm. Well, I was I we haven't talked about this beforehand, but I was hoping that I might be able to uh convince you to uh ha- let us end with a reading of <laughs> a poem. Okay. Uh yeah, I'll try. Um I've got oh, to put, put on my poetry voice though, you see, which is Yeah, no, you got... have you have a very soothing voice and cadence. So I mean the I, I can see why the poetry reading comes. You're natural setting to you. me up. Yeah, well, I, I, I got a bit strident at certain points. What would you like to hear? I'll do. I'll do, I'll do. Oh no, um, reader's choice. Just reader's choice. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Sonnet thirty. No William Shakespeare. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes, new wail my dear time's waste. When can I drown an eye unused to flow, for precious friends hid in death's dateless night? And weep afresh, love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances forgone, and heavily, from woe to woe, tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which I knew pay, as if not paid before. But if the while, I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. All right. That was terrific, Keith. Um, Thanks so much. It's really been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Oh, thank you. Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like 
subscribe, follow if you haven't already. Smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not <laughs> joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson East, please do so.